If you've never used iNav, iNav 6.1.1 is looking pretty good. There's a lot of compelling features and especially for GPS enabled drones, iNav is where it's at, it's where to be. So something like this, this GEP RC baby croc, this comes on beta flight, but it does have an iNav target. Any GPS enabled drone that might be a long range Asini lifter or coming up here, I would imagine a lot of quadcopters are gonna be GPS enabled with remote ID looming. And the first thing we're gonna get into is taking this baby croc and we're gonna translate this from beta flight to iNav in short, easy steps. And then we're gonna get into future videos with tuning and things of that nature. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and subscribe. So the first thing you need to do is plug in their quadcopter that you wanna convert over and make sure you actually have an iNav target. So up here in Betaflight, if you connect to it, you should see that this is your flight target for it. This is a GEP RC F722 all-in-one flight controller. From there, you're gonna probably want to download iNav, link down in the description for where you can get that, and then check out to see if the flight controller is a supported target. Not all the flight controllers that are supported in Betaflight with the target will have a target in iNav. There's a lot of them in here, as you can see, and I'll just do a quick scroll on that so maybe you can go slowly back through and set your video at uh, a slower pace for Ryan to kind of get a quick glimpse of that. A lot of Matex, all the speedy bees, the GEP RC is in here as well. And you know, you're gonna wanna make sure because if it's not a supported target, this video is not gonna be for you. Uh, you could get a supported target board if you wanted to switch it all out. But yeah, that's a major first step. But before flashing over, of course, what I would wanna do is go back into Betaflight here and save out your configuration. So go into the presets and then hit save back up here, save that file off. The other thing I would recommend doing is taking screenshots of certain tabs. Those tabs would be the ports tab, the configuration tab, the tuning tab, and in the pit tuning tab, you're gonna have three additional tabs, the PIDs, the rates, and the filter settings. I would get all three of those. I would get your receivers tab as well. And then if you want your OSD to look exactly the same, grab that OSD tab uh, as, of course as well, just for the, the layout here. Oh, and don't forget the modes tab as well for a screenshot. That's super important as well. Now, when you first connect to iNav, it's gonna ask you to load a preset, the three inch or the five inch. You'll have to pick what best matches your quadcopter. It's a general settings it's gonna align with versus airplanes or some other type of setup. So uh, between three inch and five inch, it's just different PID settings and things of that nature. So on this one, I'm gonna pick the five inch preset. Uh, couldn't show you that screen because the beeper was going off like crazy as I was doing that. So just pick the preset you want and hit load and then it should bring you back to this screen up here. Do note this right here where your motor outputs are not enabled by default. That's something different with iNav versus Betaflight. It's kind of like a safety concern. So you will need to enable motor outputs to do some motor testing. That is right here, that's on the outputs page. So you'll have to do is enable this motor output, servo outputs, hit save and reboot. Don't just hit save, you gotta hit save and reboot. Give it a second, it does take a sec for that to uh, power cycle, reboot up. The other thing you'll definitely wanna do in here is set this motor idle percent down. iNav is kind of gauged towards bigger quads, although I kind of feel like this was missed in that preset. You know, 15% idle is way too high for a little quadcopter. So set that down to something like five, 5.5 is what the beta flight's default is. And the settings page, I'm gonna take note of like, when I tip the nose forward on the quad, it actually tips up on the side. So I need to do a yaw angle change on this. The flight controller is put in a little bit sideways. To do that, I would go into the configuration tab here, do that, hit save and reboot. And then with that done, now you can see in here that, well, I can, Trust assured, when I tip the nose front, I see it tip front, right, and then as I yaw left and right, uh, that is working as well. So it should be in good shape. So now I'd go back to the calibration and then go and work on redoing that. Um, so just, again, hit calibration and then just run through all the different steps. So flip it upside down next. That uh, should be in good shape. Once it accepts that, it looks like even the orientation didn't make a difference on that. Just make sure to hit save and reboot and you should be good to go. The rest of the settings are pretty straightforward to set up. Your ports tab is gonna look very similar to beta flight, of course. Uh, configuration, uh, same thing as well. Uh, there's slight changes in the appearance of things, but if you're normal, you're used to beta flight, you should be okay uh, for iNav as here as well a lot of the same settings and things of that nature and a lot of things are fine as default what i do want to jump into in a little bit of detail is just bringing over some of those pid settings your rates 
uh, and your filter settings and how we can get kind of a one-to-one -to, -one to that. So let's get into that. So in starting with the filters tab, the settings between Betaflight and iNav, there's similar tools, but there's they're just set up differently. The other thing that's a little tricky with iNav is there's some hidden filtering uh, that's, you don't see it in the GUI, but it's, you can access it using the CLI commands. So by default, iNav has four low pass filters on the gyro signal. That is, the first one is the digital low pass filter, which is in the gyro itself. All flight controllers have that in some way, shape or form. So that's a given. So it's really three additional ones on top of that. Betaflight typically has three filters. One of those in both firmwares is the digital low pass filter that's in the gyro chip itself. All firmware, all gyro chips have that. All firmwares don't disable that. So that's in there. So we're really talking in Betaflight, there's two software low pass filters, where in iNav, there's three software low pass filters on the gyro signal. Two of those software filters in iNav out of the three are present on the GUI here that you can see them. The first one here is this gyro low pass filter. And then you have an option to have that to be throttle based where it moves up and down with the throttle, similar to Betaflight. That's how this is working down here. And then the second one is really this unicorn filter or really the Kalman filter. With the unicorn or AKA Kalman filter, that the Q value has to deal with where the cutoff is set for that filter. So it's just a little bit different. At the end of the day, it boils down to a PT1 low pass filter, which is the same thing as these filters up here. Again, in Betaflight, you have two low pass filters here. One is throttle based typically, and then there's an anti-aliasing or the second low pass filter here. But in iNav, there is a third filter that's turned on that they call the anti-aliasing filter. It's basically mimicking this, uh, that you don't see here on the GUI. So to access that one, we're gonna go to the CLI down here at the bottom, and then we'll just type in get LPF, and then you'll see, and that's once you type that in, hit enter, you'll see all these low pass filter settings here that you can adjust. So that third one that I'm talking about is if you go all the way up to the top, you can see it right here. There's a gyro low pass anti, they call it the anti-aliasing filter. Uh, it's, it's just another low pass filter. It's a PT1 filter type, and you can see it's set at 250 Hertz. So what I'm going to do in this scenario is I hate these hidden CLI filter things. Since we already have two low pass filters on the gyro, like I just talked about in the GUI, I'm gonna turn this one off and just deal with those two. And then I don't have to worry about this hidden one in the CLI. You do see this if you bring up the iNav OSD settings. Uh, you know, when you're out in the field, you'll see that this filter is turned on, you'll see it's set at 250 Hertz. So uh, you do see it there, it's not so hidden in that scenario. So to turn this off, I'm simply gonna type in set, paste the command, uh, for it and then put zero as the cutoff and then just hit type in save and then that will effectively turn that filter off. Now moving right on down the list, the next thing we have on the gyro signal is the dynamic notch, which in iNav is called the matrix filter. In this release, there's two variants of that. One is where it just has the normal dynamic notch, a they call it the 2D flavor of it. The other is the 3D flavor of it, where it's actually gonna put two notches on top of each other to really kind of crush out any peaks. If you look in the help, it says that, you know, it's really only for seven inches or something that you really have this persistent noise peak that's really been a problem that most quads, honestly, you'd have a kind of a mechanical thing that's really being an issue, but most quads, you just leave it on the default 2D. And then you can see there's various options here where you want this 3D where it's two notches dynamic notches on wherever it detects the peak on just the roll axis or just the pitch axis or just the all axis or the roll and pitch or the go and just variance or all three axes for the 3D, full 3D. So that's a lot of notch filter stuff. You could try that out, but for default here, we're not gonna do that. Now, the reason this is called a matrix filter, just a reminder that, so it's the, just like in Betaflight, it is detecting uh, peaks of noise on the pitch, roll and y'all axis. In old versions of Betaflight, it would just put a single notch tracking that peak. Uh, in the latest version, it can detect four or five peaks and put separate notches on those four or five different peaks. iNav can only track one peak on each access, but what it does is it will, if it tracks a peak on the roll axis, it will 
have a notch filter, track that and, and keep a notch on top of that. But it will also at that same center frequency of where that peak of noise is, it will have that notch on the pitch and roll and yaw axis as well. Same thing for the pitch. It's going to track a peak there. It's going to put wherever that peak of noise is, it's going to also replicate notches on the roll and yaw. So it has a lot more. So it's like three notches on each axis. And those three notches are based on where the peaks of noise are, are on the other axes as well. We're not going to debate the effectiveness of all that. Uh, that's how it works. So, and that's the 2D variant of this. If you do 3D, it's really six uh, notches uh, across all the, the different axes. You can set, just like in Betaflight, you can set the minimum frequency here. So that's 100 hertz. And then down here, you can set the Q factor. The default for Betaflight when you're just running the dynamic notch is a 300 Q. Here you can see we have 250, so it's a little bit wider, a little bit bigger, a little bit more delay associated with it as well. Do know that if you wanted to go a different way and turn off the Unicorn filter or the Coleman filter, you can do that in the CLI. You would type in get Coleman in the CLI, and then there's an on off option there as well. The other thing you can do with the Coleman filter to raise the cutoff frequency of this is just to raise this Q factor up. Some advice on that is raise it 50 points at a time. So 200 to 250 to three, so on and so forth, and see how that goes. You know, you could do the same thing here with these low pass filters as well. You can raise these up uh, and try different variants. Finally, to wrap out filtering on the gyro signal itself, you do have the RPM filter here, but do know that this is not using bi-directional telemetry. This is using ESC telemetry to set that, which is much slower. So this is gonna be less effective, but it is there as well. I'm not gonna use that on this build. I don't use it on all the builds in Betaflight as well, but it is here. You could give that a try. It's just not gonna be as precise in setting those notches. So then, Hence, it's not going to be as effective as Betaflight's RPM filters. Again, just in like in Betaflight, there is a minimum here as well. Now that we've covered all the filtering that is on the gyro signal, the next type of filtering that is in iNav is this D-term filter. So the D-term filter, just like in Betaflight, it is a filter on the output of the D-term into the pit sum, which then goes out and adjusts how the motors goes into the mixer and tells the motors what to do. So we're filtering PID output in this one. Again, same as Betaflight. A little difference in this one, you have one slider here, but the default filter type is a PT3. So it's really three PT1 low pass filters um, in series working at 110 Hertz. That's great, it's very effective, but it's a lot of delay too. So you can't adjust that here in the GUI to adjust what filter type that is, we'd have to go into the CLI again. So back under the CLI, type in get, LPF, and it does need to be lowercase. And in here, you will see that you also have a law, uh, yaw low pass filter, same as you do in Betaflight. But again, it's not available on the GUI. Usually you don't need a yaw low pass filter. So getting back to this D, you can see that the D term low pass filter hertz, 110 hertz. That's what we saw in the GUI. But then that filter type right here is a PT3. So you do have PT1, biquad, PT2, and PT3 options. Do note, just like in Betaflight, you can break this out. So there is a second D-term low-pass filter, LPF2, set to zero hertz, so by default, it is disabled. But if you wanted to separate those out, just like in Betaflight and have a uh, PT1 low-pass filter at 100 hertz and another PT1 low-pass filter at 200 hertz, those would be static, you can do that. There is no dynamic D-term uh, low-pass filtering in iNav available. Uh, dynamic being, just like you see here with Betaflight, you can see that this is gonna be very with throttle. But you could translate things and say, okay, well, I'm gonna split the difference between these two and set maybe a, a PT1 filter at, I don't know, 125 hertz, and then I'll set the other one at 150 hertz. These are both PT1s. That's how Betaflight's working. Same thing down here now. With iNav, you can set these exact things, 250 and 500, because you do have a throttle-based uh, option there in iNav. And you could set, you could turn off the Coleman and then just set that anti-aliasing low pass filter to 500 and you'd have the exact almost the exact match of filter setup that you'd have here in beta flight same thing down here you could it's you're gonna get it's not gonna be exact same you could turn on the the rpm filters but they're not going to be as effective you don't have the exact same dynamic notch options where you can have you know two notches that are independently tracking frequencies on each of the axes doesn't that's just that's code that doesn't exist in inav 
The Q factor is the same. So if you do have one notch and you want to put like 500, the only reason this is 500 is because the RPM filter is on, but normally this is at 300. If you wanted to type that into INAV, it would work. And then your minimum uh, is available here as well. INAV does not have a max setting that, that I saw that I'm aware of. So I think what I'm gonna do, just so I have all the filtering in the GUI and see everything, is I'm gonna go ahead and type in set and then copy and paste the low pass, uh, D-term low pass filter type code and change that from PT2 to PT3. So you can see I have that as PT2 in there. Hit save uh, on that as well. And that way it's not such a heavy filter, but it, you know, I'm still seeing the cutoff for that in the GUI and I'm not, you know, having to deal with CLI stuff. Now, when it comes to PID settings, they are not the same. So you can't just take your PIDs and put them into iNav and expect the same exact results, but they are not totally alien to each other either. They are generally within 10 to 20 percent the same as each other. The D terms seem to run a little hot, so you might want to lower your D gains and your P gains associated with it if you're that, you know, honed in on a tune. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can see in this one, I didn't, this is not tune, this is just the factory default, which I probably just beta flight default. It looks like it's just beta flight default. Uh, so this hasn't really been tuned. Uh, and I'm just gonna type in some close settings. So split the difference between, uh, you can see I did, uh, so maybe I should be doing 35 here uh, for that one and maybe split the difference on this one as well. So I got, uh, let's put that as 40 here. And you can see, and the reason I'm saying that is because this is a dynamic D gain. Uh, for the P terms, I would probably generally put these as the same. Maybe this could be uh, 50 uh, and just round these things off. I wouldn't worry about I gains. You know, they have a wide window berth to begin with, with uh, what those settings could be. So just generally get them in there, round it off. Um, feed forward also runs a little stronger in iNav. So if you had like 150, 200, 250 on feed forward, you might have to drop that down by 50 to 75 points. But generally you can take that stuff, bring it back in there. Obviously if it's a racing rig or some sort of freestyle rig that it's, you know, you have this thing like tuned to the nth degree. Yeah, you're probably gonna have a little bit more tuning, but luckily you, you know, with modern OSDs and the digital or analog, you can access all this stuff in the OSD and just tune that in the field and adjust these parameters um, kind of like you did before. It doesn't have sliders like Betaflight does, so you have to kind of manually do those ratio-y things to keep things in line. So there's no master slider. You can slide things up and down. These sliders here that it shows are not specifically, you know, they're just associated to the numbers. So they don't keep ratios between things. So. So that's gonna do it for this one. Hopefully that was helpful in a somewhat expeditious way of how to take your beta flight information, put it in the INAV, some of the stuff that's kind of a little hidden there that you might need to pay attention to with the filters, and then some general advice on the PID settings. You can bring stuff across in my humble opinion. It's not gonna be exact equivalent, so don't be expecting that, but don't just ignore it and use defaults either and expect it to fly as good. It's not going to. If I can ask you if you enjoyed this video, if you could share it around, I don't have a huge INAV audience, so I'd look to build that. And if you, know, if you thought this was helpful, also please do subscribe and hit the like button down below. I'm gonna have some additional content. Hopefully this has some decent uh, viewership and some interest on INAV for pit tuning, which can really get into broad things for altitude hold, position hold, things of that nature. Thanks everybody. See you on the next one.